I broke Stephen A. Smith, and today I'm going to show you the proof. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Tuesday. Thanks for joining me. Awesome show uh, for you today. Doug Gottlieb from Fox Sports Radio is going to join us, help us talk about LeBron James and Bronny James. Steve Kim's also going to be here to talk about LeBron James and Bronny James. Uh, but we're going to spend quite a bit of time today talking about Stephen A. Smith. I'm going to show you the receipts from me breaking Stephen A. Smith. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get $240 in free bacon with your order. Ah, Applewood smoked bacon as well. FEARLESS. GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS. Get your free bacon. Uh, <laughs> Man, am I looking forward uh, to today's show. Uh, we're going to take some time here to walk you through uh, the continued meltdown of Stephen A. Smith. Uh, if you did not catch it over the weekend, the New Orleans Pelicans jumped on board <laughs> with what we've been pointing out uh, to you all, that Stephen A. Smith has been lying about his college basketball career, the thing that I've pointed out is that he's lying about virtually everything. Virtually everything. It goes well beyond his basketball career. But I want to start showing you the receipts as we watch Stephen A. Smith melt down, break down, and lose his mind because he knows that everybody is laughing at him behind his back. And now when he gets in a confrontation with someone in the NBA, they bring it to the surface. They laugh at him out in front of everybody. Stephen A. Smith has been picking at, going at Zion Williamson, the star basketball player for the New Orleans Pelicans. And <clears throat> I wanna show you the video that the Pelicans released uh, mocking Stephen A. Smith for his trash talk he's been doing on Zion Williamson, and he's been doing a little fat shaming with Zion Williamson, and, and the Pelicans have finally had enough, and I believe it was Friday night, they released a, a video putting Stephen A. Smith on blast. Let's watch. Now, this man was a bona fide scrub. He can't play. No disrespect whatsoever, but I'm sorry to call, tell everybody the truth. The man cannot play the game of basketball. He has small hands. He can't catch the ball. He's got bad feet. He can't really move, even though he's mobile. Doesn't really know what he's doing. Doesn't have a post move that he, he puts to memory that he can do two times in a row. He has no game whatsoever. Plays no defense. Doesn't have the heart, the passion, or anything that comes with it. So that's what the Pelicans did, and they used that uh, Photoshop taken from, we had the same Photoshop, but the 17 was the number, talking about the 17 straight threes. <clears throat> but they, Stephen A's voice trash talking everybody, and then just showing the clips and the receipts of Stephen A. This is the Pelicans doing publicly what everybody in the NBA is doing privately. And this is why you know the whole media ecosystem is rigged and phony. They never talk about publicly, generally speaking, what they're talking about privately. They never get at the truth. But Stephen A is feeling the heat because I'm sure his DMs, his text messages, uh, his little private conversation, he can feel that everybody is laughing at him. Everybody knows Stephen A. Smith is a fountain of BS. And it's eating at him. And so <clears throat> yesterday, Stephen A. Smith circled back 
to address what the Pelicans did to him over the weekend. He's trying to stop. He's trying to put a, a, a Band-Aid on a dam that has broken. He's trying to plug a little hole, and he's seen other little holes, and he knows that if the Pelicans get away with publicly dissing him, it won't be long before other NBA and or NFL franchises, fan bases, he could become a meme, a joke, a laughingstock over social media. And he's paid a lot of money. And the agency, I think he's represented by WME or Endeavor, whatever, I think Mark Shapiro's his agent, whatever agency he runs now, I think with Ari Emanuel, he's at the top of the food chain and the re representation by one of the highest, most powerful agencies in the world. And they pay a lot of money to keep the social media beehive off of Stephen A. Smith and whoever they're representing, but it's reaching a point where it's too irresistible for the New Orleans Pelicans or Zion Williamson or some of these other people that Stephen A. Smith loves to troll, for them not to fire back and just say, you know what, uh, Stephen A. Smith is full of BS because they're looking at the rest of the media ignored. Like, this guy wrote a memoir that's full of so many obvious lies, and somehow he's at the top of the sports media food chain. Stephen A. has to put a stop to this. Because, yeah, when I exposed all this, because of all the money that the agency pays, because of the way the system is rigged, everybody just tried to ignore, like, man, Whitlock exposed a level of fraudulence a, 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 around Stephen A. Smith that's virtually unprecedented. We haven't seen this. An alleged journalist writes a book filled with this many holes and lies. Everybody ignored that and what they were paid to do, all the blogs, everybody knew, nope, 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 nope. Don't, don't cover any of the issues and the truth that Whitlock exposed. Cover Stephen A. Smith calling Whitlock a bunch of names. Make that the story. Not that the guy at the top of the sports media industry is a complete fraud and lying in a book. No, the real story here is that Stephen A. Smith went on a pod call, podcast and name called Jason Whitlock. Everybody write about that. Everybody make YouTube videos about that. And that's a nice little <clears throat> delay tactic. But Stephen A. can't handle the fact that everybody in the NBA and in the sports world is laughing at him behind his back. And he knows that they're going to start laughing at him in front of his face and for the world to see. And so he's chosen to circle back and try to make an example of the New Orleans Pelicans. So <clears throat> here's what he recorded yesterday as he is starting to publicly melt down and break down because the heat is too much for him and he's not built for this. He's built for when the wind is at his back and Bob Iger and his agent and agency have everything laid out on a platter for him and everyone's afraid to question and go at Stephen A. Smith. I have basically legalized and given people the ammo. Like, no, nah, man, you ain't got to take this garbage from Stephen A. Smith. He's uninformed. He's living a lie. He doesn't know anything about sports. He's highly insecure. No one that lies this much has any ounce of confidence about them. So here's Stephen A. Let's play SOT number three, I believe. This is the first 90 seconds, 100 seconds of his response to the New Orleans Pelicans. And New Orleans, um, you didn't think I was going to let you off the hook, did you? I don't know who put you up to that. But you need to be educated a little bit more about Stephen A. Smith. So allow me to educate you. Number one, I don't give a shit. It doesn't bother me that you troll me. I can take it. You see, 
Do you realize that at Division II Winston-Salem State, I could have been on the court averaging 20 to 25 a game, and I still wouldn't compare to a single one of y'all who've made it to the NBA? Do you understand that I know that no matter how you gloss over anything, meaning myself or anybody else, I don't compare to y'all? But your stats are wrong. One and a half points is less than that. I was hurt. I was hurt. Go to the hospital in Winston-Salem. 1989. I cracked my kneecap in half. They told me I might never be able to walk the same again. And even though I maintained my scholarship, I was nothing more than a practice player because I couldn't run up and down the court more than three or four times without limping. How do we know this? Because I'm 56 and I still limp after running for a little while. I'm not lying. <laughs> Period. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> And you know how we know you're lying? Because you're saying you're not lying. You are lying. And <laughs> this whole, go to the hospital. I, 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 I love that comment. Go to the hospital and, and let's get the records of I cracked my kneecap in half. Notice what's missing if you watch the whole video. What he doesn't go to now is... I have a six inch screw in my knee. He's completely dropped that because he knows how comical and stupid that is. But let me refresh your memory with how Stephen A used to unpack the story where he talked about having the, <clears throat> and I've got the six inch screw here on my, that this, a screw this size, this long is in his knee. He used to say that constantly. Uh, let's play that sock. Let's play that clip. My bone cracked in half my first year at Winston-Salem State. I still have those knee pains to this very day. Still in the knee that still has a six inch screw in it that I never took out. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he's got a six inch screw at one point in his knee that he never took out. Now that he realizes how ridiculous that is, he's massaging the lie. And so now it's just, hey, I cracked my kneecap in half. I'm not going to mention this six inch screw in my knee. The other thing that he will not mention, and I, I want to play you all, uh, or I want to show you all, this is one of the biggest smoking guns because now he didn't play any games and, and it's less than that. I didn't score any points and because I cracked my kneecap in half and, and I can't – somehow he's arguing that he stayed on the team as a practice player, but he couldn't run up and down the court more than two or three times without, his, without limping and his knee hurting. Anybody that's played college sports at any level, Division I, 1AA, Division II, Division III, make it make sense. If you played college athletics at any level, football or basketball, or even baseball, hockey, I don't care, was there anybody that was on your team and allowed to maintain a scholarship who could only go up and down the field or court or ice or only go a couple of times across a tennis court, whatever, who could only do that two or three times without severely limping. Who gets to stay on the team? Division three level, two, one double A or division one? Have you ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of that? Is that a possibility? But more than that, and these are the questions Stephen A. Myth 
needs to answer. And he keeps ducking answering this question. Put the stat sheet up from the 90-91 season. That stat sheet, the guy underlined and highlighted there, is named Stephen Smith. And there's a stat sheet, depending on whether you get it from Winston-Salem State or whether you go to the NCAA's records, that says he played nine games on one of these deals and 10 games on the other. I can't remember which is which. Did we get it from Winston-Salem State that it was nine games or the NCAA that said 10 games? Who is that Stephen Smith? Answer that question. The, he just put on a video responding to the Pelicans about his basketball career. We've seen other videos where he has was on ESPN's platform, and I've played that for you all, where they mocked him, Malika Andrews and Jalen Rose and J.J. Redick, they mocked him, and he said, it was less than that, I played one game. I only played one game, and that's why I averaged one and a half points. And then a few months later, he came out with a video that said, I never, I played zero games because I cracked my kneecap in half and I have a six inch screw in my knee. Who is the Stephen Smith that played nine games at Winston-Salem State? Or is this entire thing a scam, a fraud? Something Winston-Salem State is perhaps in on in using Stephen A. Smith as a tool to promote their university and raise money. Have they gone along with this scam that Stephen A. Smith has been executing? Oh, Big House Gaines was like a father figure to me. Big House Gaines writes a book never mentions his adopted son, Stephen A. Smith. Oh, I wrote a column when I was a member of the basketball team calling for Big House Gaines to step down. Oh, Jason Whitlock hunted up that story. It did not happen. He wrote a, someone named Stephen Smith wrote a review of the season. It never called for Big House Gaines to step down. It's a lie. Oh, in February in 1988, I had a outdoor basketball practice with a former Winston-Salem State player, and I was so impressed that the next weekend, he drove me to Winston-Salem State for a tryout where I hit 17 straight three-pointers and I got a scholarship on the spot. It makes no sense. No one that hears the story, no one that's followed, you don't even have to have played, anybody that's followed college athletics. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. He's lying. And he can point all the attention at me and, oh, Whitlock's a fat bastard and everybody hates him. Let me cop to that. I'm a fat bastard. And many people in the sports media hate me. They hate me for the very reason Stephen A. Smith hates me. I have a 30-year career of calling them out for BS and lies. 30 years. And I put out my whole list of top 50 media beefs. It's white, it's white people, it's black people, it's Jewish people that I've been calling out for 30 years. And yes, they hate me. I'll cop. Stephen A., what are you willing to cop to? Everybody is laughing. And they can all pretend like, because again, they hate me and there's a group of, big, large group of them out there that do hate me. But those same people know that Stephen A. Smith is lying and melting down. And this whole thing about, I don't give a spit. Are you kidding me? I'm never talking about Jason Whitlock again. Three, four, five interviews later. Oh, I don't give a crap what the Pelicans say about me. 
but let me record this video response to what they said about me. This fraudulent person is breaking down right before our eyes. Let me play how he ended his segment. Uh, this is about a two and a half minute clip. I want to play you how he ended his conversation about the Pelicans yesterday. Play the clip. As for me, I'm going to say this. A couple of things. Number one, my boxing coach is begging me to just put out a video because he can't stand that me leaving that video. I like the video up there because I want people to think that's how I fight. So if you roll up on me wrong, you'll get your ass kicked. That's me personally. I like to think I fight like that. But no, neither here nor there. I might do another video just to show you what a lie it is, but it's okay. <laughs> you know why it's okay? Because I'm 56. I'm a grown ass man. I'm not trying to fight. I'm not trying to play basketball anymore. I'm not trying to do those things. And for those of you who want to laugh at me, at these misnomers and these videos that they put out there and they talking about me, let me remind you of something. I don't get paid to do those things. I get paid to do this. Who's been number one for the last decade? Did you forget? That would happen to be me. And no matter what comes down the pike with somebody else who will ultimately supplant me as number one, that means, it still doesn't mean, I'm sorry, that it takes away from the fact that I've been number one. And I'm still climbing. Basketball was good enough to earn me a full scholarship ride to a four-year institution that enabled me to get my degree ultimately become a professional journalist, ultimately become a top-notch pundit, one of the best in the history of this country, who, by the way, gets paid handsomely for it. And, oh, by the way, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. This is what I do. And I've been number one at it. Can you say you've been number one at anything, New Orleans Pelicans? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Albeit rhetorically, because we all know the answer. Grow up, dial it back, and win some damn games in the playoffs so I can have the pleasure of coming to the wonderful city with the wonderful fan base that is the New Orleans Pelicans, which is being exceptionally run by Mr. David Griffin and their ownership. Fall back and focus where you need to be focused. This is comical. All the tough guy talk, and then you end it kissing David Griffin's rear end, Pelican's ownership rear end. It, it was, hey guys, don't let him make fun of me on Twitter anymore. David Griffin, I, I love you and I, the ownership, I love you. Y'all are great and I can't wait to come to New Orleans. This dude is folding tent. He is a cheap lawn chair, a cheap suit, falling apart. Oh, I don't give a spit. I can take it. No, you can't. There, there are so many things said here out of insecurity. No matter who comes down the pike and is number one next, let me translate that for you. Shannon Sharp is a tsunami. And his club Shay Shay and Nightcap are crushing what I'm able to do. I'm getting exposed in real time as a fraud. I should have never picked a fight with Jason Whitlock. The walls are coming in, collapsing around me, and Shannon Sharp will be the host of First Take, and Shannon Sharp and Colin Cowherd are going to sell the volume. They're gonna auction it off to ESPN and make a bunch of money, and I just want to enter into the record that I was number one 
for all these years. And that's his new mantra. I was number one and y'all can never take that away from me. Stop it, Stephen A. Stop it. Number one at what? Who are you competing against? A startup sports TV network that uh, threw all its money at a 70-year-old uh, Skip Bayless well past his expiration date? I mean, for many years, you were the only morning sports talk television show. The only one. There was FS1 didn't have one. And so then you compete against an upstart FS1 and Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless. And that platform on FS1 with, with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp created a monster in Shannon Sharp. And I, I don't even, I'm not saying that disparagingly. I'm saying Shannon Sharp for, for the world, for pop culture, what works in corporate media. He is now the monster. He is more talented, more authentic, with an actual legitimate background and narrative and legitimate connection to the sports world. That it's crystal clear Shannon Sharp has next, as long as he doesn't screw it up, which he can and likely will. But all this, I've been number one against who? It's no different than your basketball career. You've been running the three-man weave against air. And talking about, man, I'm shooting 90% from the field in a three-on-three -three weave line, making layups. You're making 90% of your layups unguarded and bragging about it. That's what First Take was. There was no competitive show. And then beating up an expansion team in Undisputed for four or five years. That's no great accomplishment. That you beat up an expansion. That's the Lakers taking on a high school team. And then that high school team creates a LeBron James in Shannon Sharp. And now that he's been developed on that high school team, he's taking your shine. And it's clear as day. That's bothering you. You're melting down. And he's... He started out the thing talking about, for those of you who are laughing at me, as I told you, this is what is bothering him. He knows everyone's laughing at him. He knows it. And he's upset that the Pelicans took that laughter publicly. <laughs> then, as a byproduct of diversity, equity, and inclusion. What Stephen A. Smith knows, but I earned a basketball scholarship that got me a college degree. What Stephen A. Smith knows, and what everybody with a brain knows, he did not earn a basketball scholarship. He has not earned anything. It's all been given to him. Just, just think this through. Think about anybody you know that got a athletic scholarship at the Division I, 1AA, Division II, Division III level. Do you know any of them who in high school only made the team their senior year, booted off the team a month, month and a half into the season, never did anything in high school, then somehow got a scholarship at a six-week high school career with no stats, no pictures, no nothing to show for it somehow got a junior college basketball scholarship. 
No stats, no pictures, no proof of any of it. Somehow has a playground tryout in February in New York, in February in New York, in February in New York, outdoor playground tryout. And the next week drives to Winston-Salem State at the end of their season when they're still playing games and has a tryout with the team that's in season, knocks down 17 straight threes and is given a scholarship on the spot. That's earning it? Think about all the people you know or those of you that have participated in college athletics at any level. Is that how you earned it? A six-week high school career where you're on the bench? A junior college career where you're on the bench? And a tryout during a college basketball season? Scholarship on the spot? Stephen A., Come clean, brother. Answer a few questions. That to me sounds like someone bought and paid your way onto the Winston-Salem State basketball team, period, end of story. This isn't earned. This is given. This is some sort of bribe. This is some sort of gift. It's reminiscent of your entire journalistic career. Installed, not earned. And, and, and why are you tearing him down? I'm gonna get to that. And I've already told you why, but I'm gonna re-explain it all again because he's installed to pump a message, pump propaganda into black people primarily, black men. And these Installed people that are there to pump a message, propaganda, misleading, keep you in a mental frame of mind that's unhealthy for you. They need to be exposed and called out so that you can recognize them for what they are. Stephen A. Smith didn't earn a basketball scholarship. He didn't earn his place in the sports media world. He's a puppet installed by the secular elites who have carved out a lane of buffoonery and lies for black people. That's what's going on here. And it needs to be called out. Earn nothing. That, that is not, <laughs> the, 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 they're not on the side of black people earning anything because when you earn something, then you stand on your own two feet and then you say, nah, I ain't going that far. I'm not gonna tell that lie. I'm not going to get on television and criticize and chastise black people for not taking the experimental vaccine that they call uh, a vaccine. It's an experimental medical trial. You know, I earned this position, and so I'm not going, I'm a sports writer. I know nothing about the medical profession. I'm not going to go on TV and try to convince people to take some experimental medical trial. I'm not qualified. That's a line I won't cross. And see, you're willing to draw those lines when you earn something. When it is given to you, you do what you're told all the time. I'm gonna go a step further here in this explanation. Before I do, I wanna to talk to you about our good friends at Good Ranchers. Did you know that over five billion pounds of meat are imported and sold in the United States every year? That's why you need Good Ranchers. They are the number one source for 100% American meat that I trust to feed my own family. Instead of getting overpriced imported meat at the store, Good Ranchers delivers the meat my family and I eat every day, all the time. They deliver it right to your door. And not only is all their meat locally sourced, but it's also hormone-free, vaccine-free, and it has zero antibiotics ever. You need to switch from the grocery store to Good Ranchers. Right now, subscribe to any of their 
100% American meat boxes to secure their leap year offer of free bacon for four years. That's over 70 pounds of Applewood smoked bacon you'll get just by subscribing. Wake up and smell the savings at GoodRanchers.com with my promo code FEARLESS. Their beef, chicken, pork, and wild-caught seafood is all amazing, and remember, it's all 100% American, which your grocery store cannot say. Go to GoodRanchers.com, pick your box, use my code FEARLESS, and get meat you can trust from a company that shares your values. Good Ranchers are amazing sponsors of our show, and by shopping their delicious products, you'll be supporting everything we do right here at Fearless. Stock your fridge with easy to prepare, delicious American meat right now at GoodRanchers.com. Not sure which box to choose? Try their best seller, the Rancher's Classic. Or if you got a hungry household, check out their Family Feast Bundle. Get quality, local foods you can trust and feel proud to feed your family. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use my code FEARLESS to claim over $900 in free bacon before their leap year sale ends. GoodRanchers.com, American Meat Delivered. GoodRanchers.com, American Meat Delivered. I love Good Ranchers. I'm so glad they're back with us. Please, please support an organization and great food that is supporting what we believe and what we stand for. I want to return <clears throat> to, to Stephen A. Smith. And, and I told you all when I read his memoir, what it straight shooters and first takes or what it first takes and straight shooting. I, I can't remember what the name of his book is. Uh, but anyway, his book, when I read his book, what did I say almost instantly? I said, man, this feels similar. Comes off the same way to me as the Barack Obama books. Dreams from my father. Th there's an, a narrative that Stephen A. Smith is trying to establish. He goes over all the proper talking points for uh, Democrats and for globalists. You know, he out of nowhere, when you read the book, there's like, oh, here's the pot shot at Donald Trump. Here's a section on when I had COVID and how the vaccine saved me. Here's a section on me getting pulled over by the Troy, Michigan police for no reason and there's two white colleagues with me. I need $9 to get out of jail, but these two white people just abandoned me and left, and, and Black Lives Matter. He he's, touches every critical talking point. The matriarchy, oh, he just takes a gigantic dump on his father. And oh, it's his mother, Janet. She did everything for him. I'm t he, every popular talking point that the Democrats, that the globalists, that the leftists, that progressives, that the people that want to overturn our Constitution. He touched on every one of those topics, and I was like, this dude wants to get into politics. This is all making sense, that he, he's got, you know, he, he wants to maybe be a nighttime talk show host, but he's planting seeds uh, to move into the political world. And I, so when we started talking about this three or four months ago, that, that was my first reaction reading this book. Now I wanted to play you a series of clips that let me know, like, uh, I was right. So I wanna start with sock number six. I think this is Stephen A on his first take show, kinda sorta joking around with Molly Karam and the gang uh, about moving into the political arena. I believe that's what SOT number six is. Let's play the clip. Lying here, uh, there are people in the political uh, stratosphere that have been clamoring for Stephen A to, to get more involved. So you're going to see me at times right getting now? a bit more polished Please politically, don't. and you're going to see me, and you know what you're going to see me say, Amali? My name is Stephen A. Smith. And I approve this message. Please don't get into politics. Please, <clears throat> please, please save us all. And please don't. Do I just have to say one thing. And I want to talk about Steph Curry I'm just, I'm just really quick. Y'all for I'm just full, bracing y'all. Yeah, here's a guy that got held back in fourth grade, dyslexic. Anybody that's read his writing, anybody that's had to edit his writing, you know. Stephen A's good at memory and they've improved his vocabulary, his spoken vocabulary, but the guy can't write. 
He's not very smart. He, he, he's done a video where he's mentioned in high school that a, a counselor in high school laughed, at, laughed out loud at the thought of Stephen A. Smith going to college. And so, and I've shared with you all that I've had people reach out to me about Winston-Salem State, and I wanna apologize to those of you with Winston-Salem State degrees. I'm sure uh, you earned them, and I'm sure it's a great education, and I'm sure you're doing awesome in life, and I'm sure you're one of the most qualified people on the planet. Don't be offended by what I'm going to share or repeat what was shared with me by uh, people from North Carolina. But Winston-Salem State, back in the 80s, guy reached out to me and was like, man, one of my buddies could not get into any, he was a great football player, great athlete, could not get into any college in America. His grades were so terrible. The only school that would take him was Winston-Salem State. And this person contended that you didn't even need a high school diploma to get into Winston-Salem State. This, just telling you what I was told, and I'm telling you what I know about some HBCUs. They're not all Howard University. They're not all Morehouse. So, and, and, I'm not even dissing or complaining about that because I think we need avenues for higher education for everybody. I've told you about me. I graduated high school, I think with a 2.8, a 900 SAT score. If I couldn't play football, Ball State wouldn't have touched me with a 10 foot pole. I graduated Ball State with a 2.3 because, you know, I mostly like to socialize and drink, play a little football, smoke a little dope, and I'm just keeping it real about me back then. So I, I'm not against giving, every, there's some late bloomers. I certainly was one, a very late bloomer. Didn't figure things out till I was about 22 years old. My last year of college, I did well academically because I actually tried. But I graduated with a 2.3, so I'm not trying to say I'm better than anybody else. But there may be a reason why a kid from New York who got held back in fourth grade and who while in high school, counselors laughed at the thought of them going to college. There may be a reason why he ended up at Winston-Salem State. It might be the only school that would allow someone with his transcripts into the school. Might have been the only place someone could have paid enough money to let him into the school under the pretense that he was some sort of basketball player. More than likely, Stephen A. Smith was a manager on that basketball team for some short period of time. Maybe briefly they put him in a uniform and they gave him the Wilt Chamberlain photo, but whoever the Stephen Smith is that played nine games according to the stat sheet, that ain't this Stephen A. Smith. Uh, we can say that factually, because if he were the guy that played nine games according to that stat sheet, he would claim that, but he's saying he never played. But my contention is that this guy's uh, academic career and record is so suspect that maybe there was only one school, some tiny school down in North Carolina, that would allow someone as limited as Stephen A. Smith on their college campus. Hats off to Winston-Salem State. But this guy is trying to create a narrative that he could actually run for political office and he's qualified. And I've seen people and I think, well, like Stephen A. Smith thinks he could be president of the United States. And maybe things have become so farcical in America that maybe he could be. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know. But let's play sock number seven of 
Stephen A. Smith talking about or speculating about just entertaining the thought of running for president. He asked me that question and I said, if the American people wanted me to run for the presidency of the United States of America, I would strongly consider it. And damn it, I mean it. I mean, it, listen, listen, it, 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 it ain't that big of a standard. I mean, let's call it what it is. I think I got a shot. I mean, I just I don't know. I don't know if people will vote for me, but if they convinced me that they wanted me to do it, I would strongly consider it. Let's play the clip. We've already seen this one, but him talking it, we saw it previously a month or two ago. Uh, him talking with Howard Stern about how much he wants to debate Donald Trump. Obviously, I have my show first take on ESPN every weekday morning, right? Yes. It's a debate show. I would love to be in a presidential debate. I nothing. I think you do great. Oh my! No, no, I'd eat him alive. Yeah, but you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't run for the presidency, but I debate Trump any day of the week, any day of the week. Name the time and place, and I'd show up. He'll debate Donald Trump, but he won't answer simple questions about his basketball career. But he'll debate Donald Trump. How many foreign countries across the globe do, do, do you think Stephen A could map on a globe? Name, pronounce, know who the leaders are, any of that. How, how many? But he wants to debate a guy that sat in the president's chair for four years. But he can't even provide a simple explanation for how a stat sheet says, hey, I mean, you played nine, ten games here. You say you played zero. What's the truth here? Who is Stephen Smith on the stat sheet? Show me a legitimate teammate. Don't run Gary Stevens out here, this midget that's five foot nine and running around the country pretending to be your former college teammate. And that Gary Stevens actually played tiny, small college basketball up in New York. Don't run this guy. There's no record of him ever being registered at Winston-Salem State. Look, look, you see the four people on the left, the group of midgets, Stephen A is six foot one. The guy to the right of Stephen A is Gary Stevens, who in one story is listed as a six foot three guard. This is years ago, but there's no records, there's no stats, this Gary Stevens, but Gary Stevens and Stephen A. Smith fly around the country together, partying together, claiming to be former Winston-Salem State teammates. Stephen A. Smith played on a team of midgets. I've reached out to Winston-Salem State players. None of them want to talk on the record. They don't want to get involved because they know the scam that's going on and that Winston-Salem State is generating money off the myth that Stephen A. Smith was some sort of uh, college basketball player. Stephen A. Smith won't address the, the Mama Roseboro, the woman he claims is his college professor, always listed in newspaper accounts and in yearbooks as a secretary for the chancellor. Don't want to talk about, this is politics. This is, and, and this is why I don't really don't like politics or politicians, because they're all this kind of dishonest. Like Barack Obama created some narrative about himself, but this goes on with all of them. Not just Obama, this, this is Bill Clinton's narrative. All of them got some kind of phony false narrative about themselves. Democrats or Republicans? Hey, take JFK. I like JFK. I wasn't around when he was around, but I like him. But you go dig into his history and how much of it was manufactured and manipulated by his, bro by his dad, Joe. This has been the history of American politics for about 100 years that people are installed in that office and manufactured backgrounds are put together. That's what's going on with Stephen A. Smith. Let's play sot number nine, Stephen A. talking about the governor wanting him to run for Senate. And one time I was approached by Governor Everett Dell in Pennsylvania. He wanted me to run for Senate. Yeah, he said, you should, you, he said, you should do it. I said, I, you don't know, I'm not a liberal. You know, I'm not a conservative either, but I'm not. He said, don't matter with you. Don't matter with you. You're a voice that needs to be heard. He told me this about close to 10 years ago. 
Stephen A. Smith is a voice that needs to be heard. So, and I'm open to this. Someone show me anything profound Stephen A. Smith has ever written or said. Any commentary about American history, culture, any news event that is profound, that is eye-opening, that, that's some sort of unique angle on the topic that gave you a new way to think about it. Show me any indication of that. What Stephen A. Smith was able to do in the sports media, hey, uh, I think Allen Iverson wants to be traded, or I think LeBron James wants to play here, or someone told me, he used to give news tidbits. For a profound thinker, a voice that needs to be heard, no one has ever thought that about Stephen A. Smith. He trolls Cowboys fans. He trolls Kwame Brown. He trolls Zion Williamson. There's no journalist. <clears throat> I got to be careful because I don't want to irritate people. But there are no legitimate journalism awards that he's ever won for his writing. Or He'll get some sort of lifetime achievement award, but there's no piece of work that he ever put together as a journalist where someone say, hey, man, this is at an award-winning level, and we need to recognize this. This has set a new standard. That's not him. That's not what he does. He's not profound. He's a very limited intellectual who they've helped expand his vocabulary, and he is sometimes funny on first take, but he's always loud and, hey, look at me. That's what he's known for. So I'm going to reach a crescendo here and just get to the final point. Stephen A. Smith and Charles Barkley recently collaborated on Stephen A. Smith's podcast. And they, it was a, they didn't talk about the NBA. They talked about politics. And, and Charles Barkley is someone that I still consider a friend. And, and St Charles Barkley has never treated me uh, with anything but respect, and I want to make sure that I do that in turn and treat Charles Barkley with nothing but respect. I, I want to just point out here, though, that over the last six to eight years, as Trump derangement syndrome has overtaken America, and the requirements uh, to stay on television and in the good graces of TV executives have heightened. I, I believe that Charles Barkley has publicly changed uh, quite a bit. And, and look, maybe they're all uh, authentic changes. And, and, and you know, only Charles can speak to that. But the Trump derangement and the political correctness and the alphabet mafia and fear of being attached to Jeffrey Epstein and the requirements for, for, to earn 15, 20, 30 million dollars a year on TV and what you have to say, all of that has been elevated. And with that elevation, I've seen guys like Charles Barkley start becoming passionate about things that I was like, oh, I, he's that passionate about transgenders and, and, you know, the LGBTQ and, you know, more power to him. And, and maybe it comes from a, a real place, but I, I just think all of these guys know that there are things they have to say to stay in the good graces of the secular elites who run Hollywood. The secular elites who disavow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There are things you have to say. And so 
I think Charles, Stephen A., and, and have jumped on that. And as more and more black people come out of their Trump derangement syn syndrome, the people that have been installed or don't even know they've been installed, but the people that are, rec are put in place or can be used as tools to keep black people thinking the exact same thing, keep black people supporting the exact same things that haven't been working for us. There's been more pressure put on them, and so they're starting to say things that are completely different from how they represented themselves eight years ago, six years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. But I wanna play SOT number 11, Stephen A. Smith and Charles Barkley uh, talking about political candidates. I am a fiscal conservative and a social liberal, which makes me an independent. I'm all for liberalism on the social side. I'm about gay rights, transgender rights, et cetera, et cetera, uh, pro-choice. I don't believe I have a right to tell a woman what to do with her body. Um, but in the same breath, when we look at a lot of policies that come raking through Capitol Hill or sifting through Capitol Hill, one of the things that obviously plays a role in every single decision that is made they ask you how you're going to pay for it, like Planned Parenthood. OK, pro-choice. You can be pro-choice. But do you think somebody has the right to say that, you know what, if I wanted an abortion, that federal funding should subsidize that? So you think about things like that. That's one mm -hmm. thing I think about certain Republican candidates. Would I vote for Nikki Haley? I would strongly consider it compared to what we have out there. I strongly think about it. I was a fan of John Kasich. When he ran in 2016. Hey, Stephen A., um, Stephen I A., know, John yeah. Kasich is the only Republican I've ever voted for for president. Wow. You voted for I him? I did. Wow. He's the, only Republican. Never, the only, He's the only Republican I've ever voted for for president. The only Republican I've ever voted for, period, was Chris Christie. And that was a governor in New Jersey because I couldn't stand Corzine at the time because I thought he was an absolute mess. But I thought about Christie. I, I, you look at Kasich, um, definitely him. Marco Rubio is somebody I would have considered. Jeb Bush is somebody I would have considered. And I bring those nuggets up, Charles, to get to this point in terms of what you said about the Democratic Party. I despise when folks look at Republicans and automatically throw out the word race because that implies that on the Democratic side, none of them are. And last time I checked throughout history, there have been Democrats who were associated with the Ku Klux Klan and other things that were any that were widely considered racist and they were a part of the Democratic Party. So when we get caught up in that and we don't know our history enough or at least well enough to know what role the Democrats have played in the past, it gets me a bit concerned because that to me is why black folks are struggling because we're very adamant and open and transparent against the Republican Party. As a result, it gives the Democrats a license to take us for granted. And then that's how we become disenfranchised because we don't really have anybody representing our interests. Well, that's where I'm coming from with it. How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, you, you hit on some, some serious PowerPoints there. Number one, I'm pro-choice. Uh, I'm really pro-choice. I don't think we should tell women how to do what to do with their body. Uh, right. Listen, I think the one thing we have to realize both of these parties are full of shit, Stephen A. That's the first thing we have to. So <clears throat> their job is to support the establishment, the status quo. And, and that's all they're doing. And, and the MAGA movement, whether you like it, dislike it, agree with it, disagree with it, or whatever, it's not the establishment. It's not the status quo. And, and more and more people, and again, this is what Bernie Sanders, what he represented was like, ah, we don't want the establishment. Trump represents that on the other side. We don't want the establishment. And the puppet masters, the people in control, are looking at more and more black men and just black people become dissatisfied with the establishment either direction but, but in particular, the left-wing establishment and, and Charles and Stephen A are having a political discussion and, and are being used or being pushed 
to help, hey man, as a black man, here's what you should think. You should think that being pro-abortion is in your best interest, or as they like to call it, pro-choice, is in your best interest. No one should tell a woman what to do. You should think that's in your best interest. The, Stephen A. talked about transgenderisms, and, and I, you know, what did he say? I'm fiscally conservative and socially I'm liberal. That's what they want you to think. And, and that's what Stephen A. has pretending to be some sort of Christian and being mentored by some Christian minister. It's all a gimmick and an act because there are no Christian ministers who are pro-abortion. There are no legitimate Christian ministers, legitimate ones, who are like, hey, transgenderism, homosexuality, that's all good. And well, it's just not, they're incompatible. It, it doesn't exist. There are people pretending to be Christian ministers that, that are on that. But the Bible's crystal clear on all of this. And so what they're doing is transitioning and normalizing for black. Step away from your Christian values and go with these secular values. And so when people say, I'm fiscally conservative and socially liberal, what they're saying is, I'm going to translate it for you, what Stephen A. Smith is saying, I'm rich, I want to pay as few taxes as possible, and then whatever I want to do sexually, I want the freedom to do that with a clear conscience. That's what he's really saying. And when I say whatever I want to do sexually, I mean whatever. I'm, oh, a child? Pedophilia? Yes, I'm socially liberal. All holes, no barred, enter me through my rear end, mouth, whatever. That's what, I'm socially liberal. There's no rules, I don't want any rules, I don't want to play by any rules on that. I want to pay less taxes, and I want the freedom to be as sexually perverted as I possibly can be. That's what it means. And I wish they would just step out and say it and stand on it. Don't, don't tell me it's about, so. oh, I know this transgender person. I know this gay person. Oh, I know this pedophile. No, it's about you. And, and trust me, I've been there. I've been there. The, the more sexually promiscuous I was, the more I wanted everybody else to have the freedom to do whatever they wanted to do because it made my sexual sin seem insignificant. And so I'm not calling Stephen A. Smith or Charles Barkley gay. I'm not doing that. Certainly not as it relates to Charles Barkley. What I'm saying is I've been in that mentality where you want to sleep with this woman or that woman or these two women and that three women, and be able to say, well, at least I'm not gay. At least I'm not into uh, transsexuals. At least I'm not a pedophile. Those are the real bad people. I'm just sexually promiscuous. That's what socially liberal means. I don't want any rules. What, what it, let me... I want to reject the Bible is what it really means. I don't want to be governed by the Bible. I want, literally, and what, they, what they're really saying is, I want to be saved, but I don't want any, I don't want a Lord. I don't want anybody setting up any rules for me. I got enough money, and if I keep the government from taxing it, I can do anything and everything I want to do on this planet, and I deserve it. I can pleasure myself however I please. And if someone talked me into going to some party out in Hollywood and slipped some drug into my drink, and they violated me from my rear end, and I just want to forget about it or pretend like it doesn't matter, I want that freedom. I, I think there's one more side here, and then we'll, we'll get. 
get out of here and move on and talk some some LeBron James with Gottlieb and Steve Kim. But uh, let's play this final clip where they kind of uh, talk about race and transgenders. Yeah, players. but, you know, man, there's some interesting times we're in, uh, a political climate, this uh, political climate we're in where, you know, people are trying to block the, vet, the, the black vote in certain states. Uh, I think we really need to pay attention to that. Uh, you know, people have been really harsh. Uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of gay, transgender people. That there's mm -hmm. a lot of hate and discrimination going on against gay and transgender people. Because I mm -hmm. want to make sure I stand up for those people. Because, you know, there are very few people who are going to have enough power uh, to to stand up for those type of people. And I always want to make sure I stand up against any form of discrimination. And I feel very good, very confident. Like I say, I don't think I'm always right, but if I see any hatred, you know, we got a lot of anti-Semitism going on right, right now. I'm standing up for those people because I want them to stand up for me. That goes back to my original thing. Like, hey, man, I want allies. I'm not trying to alienate anybody. I don't want to be on an island by myself. Anybody want to help black people? I want your help. I want your support. You know, because the, the wealth gap in this country has exploded. You know, things have, we got this presidential election coming up. That's a really, really big. That's where I was going. It's a really, really big deal. We got two candidates. Uh, I'm not happy with either candidate. Uh, Neither am I. I. I think that, you know, uh, Mr. Biden's had a great, great life and career. I just think he's too old to be the president. So, and 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 I get what Charles is saying, and and but he just checked the Alphabet Mafia. I'm standing up for them, and and blacks standing up for them, Jewish people. I'm standing up for them, and and I just want you to understand the line in the sand that. Or, or what separates me, and again, I, I like Charles, I respect Charles, but we have a strong disagreement here. Very strong disagreement. What you will not hear any of them say is I'm standing up for Jesus Christ. And, and, and I have a right to stand up for Jesus Christ, God, What's in the Bible? I get to stand on that just as much as they get to stand for who they want to stand for. I get to stand for who I want to stand for. And, and what I have been standing on. Founded this country, those principles founded this country. And if those principles hadn't been put in place, all the money that Charles Barkley has, all the money Stephen A. Smith has, all the fame and the pampered life that they have. They wouldn't have any of it if this country wasn't founded on those principles. So I'm not going to reject Jesus Christ so that uh, all those other little groups that he's talking about feel comfortable and feel loved and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, I'm a fat person. I'm not going to stand up for fat people. It's wrong. It's a sin. It's unhealthy. It's a bad look for God. I'm just not, I'm not going to stand up for them. I'm going to stand up for Jesus Christ and, and that way of life and living, and I'm going to try to defend that. I will fail in my attempt to live up to all of that. I'm going fall. I'm going to do the best that I can. But I'm going to be flawed. I'm going to mess up, but but that's where I'm going to stand. And and so I get it. There's money to be made if you rattle off those three little groups that Charles rattled off. You could you too can be worthy of a mega television contract and and be installed as a icon in pop culture, I, I just 
I, I can't do it. And, and when I look at Stephen A. Smith in totality, people, oh, you just criticize, you just a hater. What Stephen A. represents is a movement to continue to walk black men and black people away from Jesus Christ and God. And I object. I object strongly. And will continue to object. And so those of you that have bought into racial idolatry and think that every decision can be decided through some sort of racial lens. Well, he's black and he's famous and he's got a lot of money and Jason shouldn't talk about him. He shouldn't criticize. If, if, if you're only capable of that simplistic of a worldview, this isn't the show for you. I'm not the personality for you. You're always going to hate what comes out of my mouth. There's a set of values and principles that I'm going to defend. And when I violate those values and principles, I should be called out. Hopefully I'll call myself out. But, but I'm trying to connect with people who share my values and principles. The people that see Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Stephen A. Smith doesn't. Uh, most people in corporate media don't. Or they have to conceal the fact that they do. But <clears throat> that's my uh, daily dose of Stephen A. Smith. We'll lighten up the conversation, talk about LeBron James and Bronny James. Uh, Bronny isn't quite the NBA prospect that uh, LeBron James thought he was. Uh, we'll talk about that with Doug Gottlieb. Before, I, before we get to Gottlieb, though, I, I do want to make sure you guys are signing up for Roll Call, Roll Call 2.0 right here in Nashville, Tennessee on Saturday, June 1st. Uh, go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com, fearlessarmyrollcall.com. we got special rates for those of you that are church leaders, uh, elders in your church, ministers in your church. If you're bringing a group to Nashville, we got discounted tickets for you. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Come to Roll Call 2.0. We're going to talk about growth and how it requires sacrifice. Doug Gottlieb, next. Vince Everett Ellison, previously on Fearless. You know, the first commandment is, I'm, I, 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 you should have known the God before me. Uh, 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 you, I, I'm, I am your father. You are my child. You come to me for what you need. And for the, uh, hundred, for the first hundred years after the, Civil, uh, after the Civil War, that's what we did. And we made more progress the hundred years after the Civil War than we made in the past 50 years. Because we have jettisoned that ideology, and it came from the Civil Rights Movement. You know, when King said, we come to, you know, I heard him say uh, right before the Poor People's March, we're coming to Washington to get our check. You walked around telling black people that white racists had the ability to stop the children of God, that they had more power than Jesus Christ. And we had to turn to government to defeat these people. As promised, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about LeBron James and Bronny James, ESPN has removed Bronny James, the USC freshman, uh, from their 2024 mock draft. Uh, LeBron James's uh, vision, dream of playing with his son in the NBA seems to be being delayed for at least a year. Uh, there's a mock draft that has Bronny James, I think, at like 39th. Uh, in the 2024 mock draft, that would be the second round. Uh, that's probably someone doing him a favor. Uh, this has triggered uh, a little bit uh, LeBron James, uh, who tweeted out and then deleted this tweet yesterday. Can y'all please just let the kid be a kid and enjoy college basketball? The work and results will ultimately do the talking no matter what he decides to do. If y'all don't know, he doesn't care what a mock draft says. He just works. Earned, not given. Now, LeBron earlier was tweeting out about how, you know, Bronny, man, Bronny definitely better than some of these cats I've 
been watching on League Pass today. Shit, lightweight, hilarious. And then at some point he said this season he could play for us right now. Easy, easy. Uh, he seems to be backing down from that. The only person I know who follows college basketball in the basketball world uh, very closely and, and from an informed perspective and who is fearless enough to actually say what is actually the truth about uh, <laughs> Bronny James is our next guest, Doug Gottlieb from Fox Sports Radio. He's the host of the Do Doug Gottlieb Show on Fox Sports Radio, former colleague of mine when I was at FS1. Doug, uh, thank you uh, for joining me. Of course, you guys remember Doug, a basketball player at Oklahoma State, uh, point guard for Eddie Sutton. Uh, Doug, I just need someone informed to tell me the truth about Bronny James. What type of NBA prospect is he? I don't really think he is one at this point. Uh, I mean, prospect is a is a very broad term, okay. But like, I I have no idea. Jonathan uh, Gavoni is a a respected guy. He started his own website, and then uh, as part of Adrian Wojnarowski moving over to ESPN, he came alongside, and he's like the draft guru. He he works really hard, so it's not a and uh, but somehow last year, Gavoni put him as like the. 10th rated prospect in the upcoming draft. Jason, as you know, seven years ago, I moved out to Southern California where I grew up and I have an AU program. I, wa I go and watch high school games. And last year, Bronny James wasn't one of the top five, maybe even top 10 players in his high school league. It's, it was the best league in the country. Some schools had three, four division one players, including his program was at Sierra Canyon, but he just wasn't. And, and somehow he was a McDonald's all American. I, I think what LeBron has that last tweet was actually what I've been saying about Bronny for a long time. Like, look, he he's not he doesn't really have a position. He's a lot smaller than you think. He's got to learn how to play at that level. It's really hard in college basketball right now to play at 18, 19 years old because you have guys, COVID year seniors, six year guys, whatever. Uh, he's got a teammate, Boogie Ellis, who was a McDonald's All American, went to Duke, then to Memphis, now been in SC. Like, dude's like 23 years old. Of course, he's going to be better than, than Bronny James. And so my thought was, like, just let him be a kid. Okay. Come off the bench his first year. And of course, he had that, uh, that, that scary heart issue. Come off the bench as a freshman, hopefully start as a sophomore. By a junior year, he'll probably be an all-league player. His senior year, got a chance to be something really special, and maybe then he's a pro. Now, what I do like about uh, how he plays and how he'll have to play if he makes the NBA is he's a he's what you call a blend player, Jason. Is He doesn't need the ball to be effective. He can let all the stars play and spot up and shoot and then guard. But again, like... There's a difference between doing that in high school and doing that as a college bench player and doing that in the NBA. And my fear was, and still remains, that because LeBron so badly wants to play on the same team as his son, that his son's development will get cut short. And he's, Bronny has never been an alpha. He's not a takeover a game guy, which is okay because when he gets to the NBA, he ain't going to be good enough to take over a game. You got to learn to play without the basketball. That's great. But there's a lot of growth that has to happen, and you can only get that over time and reps at a higher level than he played in high school. He's averaging five and a half points a game this year as a freshman at USC. Are, are there very many guys that jump to the NBA after averaging five and a half points a game? Well, I mean, the truth is Florida State's actually had uh, first-round draft picks that haven't averaged 10 points a game. So it, you know, remember, like drafts now are a lot more about being developmental okay, than they are about like being finished products. Finished products um, are usually usually guys who have been there longer. And those guys go end of the first round, second round because you know who they are and you feel like they've topped out. So it's not crazy to have a guy who doesn't average double figures. But again, there's way more to it than just he's averaging five or so a game. They're terrible. OK, and their talent shouldn't be terrible. And again, I'm not putting any blame on Bronny per se. Like he's not a bad kid. He's not a look at me kid. And he doesn't get the ball and try and do things that he can't do. But there is something to the attention. 
And whether you want to say it's a distraction or the way that other guys feel about it. He's got a kid named Isaiah Collier who came into the year as the number one prospect. Now, he was being overrated and overhyped, doesn't shoot it well enough, doesn't guard well enough, and he's probably going to go in the lottery to middle of the first round. But the, the point is they spent a lot of money, which is legal now with NIL, which is really pay for play, to, to put some quality players around him. You got a glue guy, Dennis Rodman's son, DJ Rodman, transfers in from Washington State like he's a glue guy. You got experience. You have a coach who's coached in Elite Eight uh, in Andy Enfield. And yet it's been kind of a disaster. So I don't know how much of the hype surrounding Bronny has made this group dysfunctional. Um, they've had injuries as well. But it's not just he's averaging five a game. When he started, he scored more points, but they've been worse as a team. You know, his biggest, the, the one game in which he scored a bunch of points was Oregon State, the second worst team or one of the worst teams in the league, and they lost by 20. So, uh, again, there's there's just a long way. You can't just, it's not a direct correlation stats to quality of player. But in this particular case, when he plays big minutes and he scores more, gets more opportunities, it's not helping them win yet. So I do think he's going to be a really good college player, and I'm sure there's a window there where he's going to get, a shot in the NBA, but in terms of him actually contributing and not being there just because you don't want to be like a Giannis's brother, right? Where it's kind of a laughing stock. LeBron doesn't want that. He wants his son to play, but he doesn't want him to be laughed at or said he's only there because he's LeBron's son. So there's a balance between the two. And I do think with some growth, he can get closer to that. Shooting 27% from three, 37% from the floor, and, and the other thing that you told me off air and kind of intimated here, is he a legit 6'4"? How big no. is he? No. There's a, there's a, if you go and look on the internet from last year, last summer, Jason, um, his younger brother Bryce was measured out. And people want to say Bryce is like 6'7". I've seen 6'5 to 6'7". And Bryce measured out bare feet at 6'2 and a half. And Bryce is taller than Bronny. So again, like if the, the truth is he's probably six two, six two and a half with shoes on, right? In the six one variety without. Right? That's small point guard size in the NBA. You can be a combo guard. Okay. But if you're gonna be a combo guard at that size, you have to be super elite at one thing. You gotta be super elite. And usually scoring is that thing. Okay. Or you can be come in, be a lockdown defender and just space the floor as a shooter. He's not there yet as a defender. He's not there clearly yet as a shooter. And he's definitely not there as a one-on-one -on -one guy. And he's not particularly big. And and why, you know, why size does matter more. Yes, I said that. Than it did previously in the NBA because of how everybody plays, right? You you have to you switch one through four. So you're guarding not just the point guard, you're guarding all the way up to whoever the four man is or power forward. And just it's a limiter. If you're going to be that small, you have to be exceptional at one thing. And to this point, he's not exceptional. I also think there's one other element to it, which is interesting, and I, I love your opinion. You know, when you were at FS1, we went through the Lonzo Ball deal, right? And the one thing about Lonzo is Lonzo never had a takeover room personality. His dad did. And so in many ways, it made Lonzo kind of quiet, right? That's kind of how Bronny, like... Bronny goes the other way of LeBron's personality. LeBron's personality and persona sucks up all of the oxygen in the room. And so Bronny, like he's not a jerk. Like he's just a nice kid that likes to go out and hoop and 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 he I'm sure he enjoys the finer things, right? He grew up uh, grew up wealthy. But the point is that it, it takes a different mentality to make it in the NBA. Like there's and this is a real thing that people a lot of these former players talk about and especially former players who didn't grow up with any money like when we all grew up we didn't have anything and making it in sports was our way to make it in life that was our way out right i'm not gonna sit here and say i grew up in the hood but i wasn't going to a high level college my parents didn't have money they already put my my other two through school right and so there's a certain and i wanted to make it right i had there's a there's a hunger it takes there and again, this is not saying that he doesn't work hard. This is not saying that he's soft, but there's a difference there in personality and tenacity. 
Like, dude, you look at guys that are six, two and below in the NBA and you can go through and name them all. And with the exception, maybe of Kyrie Irving and a couple other super, super skilled guys, they're all a-holes, right? Like Chris Paul, like, oh, Chris Paul is dirt. Like, dude, to be five foot 11, six feet and play in the NBA, you have to be tougher than a $2 steak. You just do. And that's I got something a great that one I don't. For you. I got go a ahead. great one for you that you're exactly right. I hadn't thought about. Just think about Isaiah Thomas. He was an assassin. I of mean, course, he, not, he not was just, an it's assassin. not just assassin. It's not just it's not just about an assassin as a score. It's not just that. It's a a guy that on your team you love him. Everybody else hates him. Um, or yes, that, that's every, Isaiah. Every, yes. yes, and every game he's ever played in his entire life, some of the other team wanted to fight him. Like that's just naturally yeah. what happens. That's that's and that's why all these guys mostly become coaches too because they have that same kind of tenacity and work ethic and and it's a bit of nastiness that you don't necessarily want as your friend. Um, but I'm telling you, I'm gonna you give look, you Patrick another Beverly. great one uh, that's in the Patrick league right pa- now. What you're basically describing, Patrick Beverly. Yes, yep. that's where I was going. Yes, right. Yeah, a dog. Right. That that's be, that because hates. because you don't physically you don't really belong. Okay, and they're going to try and punk you at every possible. And now you're LeBron's son. Like, dude, I'm telling you exactly what happens when he checks into his first summer league game. It's the old one of these wave out, clear out. Like they're going to try and punk you. Dude, my son's tiny. He's a little eighth grader. I think he's going to be. But he's actually had to do this because people know who I am. Everybody acts like I was some better player than I actually was. And he'll get ISO. And he's had to learn like, dude, you got to toughen up or you just. You don't like it? Go play another sport. It's okay. Like go play baseball. You know, go do go something, do something else. So I there there is one element to it because I actually like I like Brian. Like I, if I was coaching a college program and I could and they'd say, hey, you're going to have him for four years. Like, dude, he's going to be really good. Um, I just it's the I think LeBron did him a disservice saying he could play. He's better than guys in the NBA. He could play for the Lakers right now, and obviously now he's backpedaling s- substantially with it. But he's also a dad. And I think he's probably overcompensating for the fact that he didn't have a dad and he's trying to look out for his kid. And uh, my high school coach would say it all the time. Like, Hey, just remember dads are blinded by love. Right. Uh, you know, my dad told Rick Majerus when he was recruiting me, Rick, he passes better than Stockton. And Rick Majerus turned to my dad and said, Bob, don't ever say that out loud again. Right. So, um, so, I mean, like this is very par for the course, with dads, it just feels different because LeBron and other people, you know, they want to curry favor. They don't want LeBron to, they don't want to crush LeBron's kid. So it's hard where to rank him. But again, when I, when you take off the name James and you just watch him and you watch his development, like he's a nice player. He's a, he's going to be a good college player. He was not a top 50 kid last year. He was not probably a top hundred kid last year. And uh, he's on a really good path at SC if they would just not disrupt the process. And that process was disrupted by the hard thing, but he wasn't going to start if not for the hard thing. Like He wasn't beating out Boogie Ellis. He wasn't beating out Isaiah Collier. Like He just wasn't. The plan is come off the bench this year, and they thought he'd be better. He's not. Come back next year, be a starting combo guard, and see where it goes. And the only question is now, like, does LeBron force it this year and he goes into the G League just because LeBron only has one year left? And I, I don't know the answer to that one. Is there any chance Bryce is the better player? Yeah, is there a chance? Of course. Um, because Bryce is kind of a, a late bloomer. He's taller. Um, but uh, it's a the, the, the late to the game things and the stories that we've heard over the last 30 years – they don't happen nearly as much anymore. You know, usually those are guys that, that have a late growth spurt. So is there a chance? Yes. Is it going to happen? He's not crazy skilled. He's just not. Um, he plays hard. He's really athletic. He's kind of a pogo stick. But to be that guy, again, you got you to gotta buy into the other things. Like there's a lot of different ways to make it in basketball. You don't have to be the all-time leading scorer the way his dad is. So is there a chance? Yeah, because he does have great energy. He is bigger. He's probably more athletic, uh, but he's a lot more raw because he hasn't been sort of the chosen basketball child. He's kind of late to the game. So he's an interesting one, uh, you know, in terms of how he develops. But the other part to it, which is interesting, you know, he 
He switched schools in the summer, then switched to another school, and now he's back at Sierra Canyon. And again, they've had another, they've been better, but a little disappointing of a year, despite the fact they have a loaded group of talented players. And so I, it's really weird to know what's going on and what level of jealousy. High school kids and college kids just aren't built for that level of jealousy and envy over what kids have and hype. You know, guys that get hype when they think they don't deserve it. Doug, uh, thank you so much. I owe you a favor. I, I needed this breakdown. You're the only guy I knew that I could trust to get an informed opinion on this. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, that's hey, Doug Tom, Gottlieb. Man. Check him out at Fox Sports Radio, the Doug Gottlieb Show. Uh, one of the most honest people talking about basketball. I know I could get a authentic, honest take about Bronny James. Uh, we'll continue the conversation uh, with the Korean co sales Steve Kim. Next. Them said I'm gay and this or that, it ain't affecting my bottom line. I'm, I'm gay. I've been happy for, for years. You're gay. It don't it ain't affecting my bottom line. And I got news for you. That means you're gay. Now, if it'll start to affect my bottom line, right. then I'm gonna see, I'm gonna make y'all put I'm gonna put you make you put your cars on the table. Yeah. It ain't gonna That's be no I'm flush gonna do. either. You ain't gonna you ain't I'm gonna make you put no your cars on the table. What are you retarded? So he I know you're not retarded. But what are you, Down syndrome? On the table. But that don't bother me. It's that you lied and you didn't have to. And she's here. See, this is what I'm talking about. The, the, you lied, but you didn't have to. That he's pretending that's what bothers me. All right, time for your favorite part of the show, my least favorite part of the show. Uh, time for some Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell, uh, going to join us. Uh, Steve, we just had Doug Gottlieb on. He gave us a terrific basketball breakdown of Bronny James and, and put his prospects and, and playing style in proper perspective. I want to have a little tiny bit of a different conversation with you. And it relates to LeBron and whether or not he put Bronny in an unfair position. And so initially I want to frame the conversation this way. If we had to say, who do you think has been a better basketball dad? LeVar Ball, or LeBron James? Hmm. I think it's pretty evident that LeVar, your old friend, he had more to work with. I mean, I remember when his first son went to UCLA. I, I forgot the name. It starts with an L. But I think it was in 2017 or 18. Jason, Lonzo. that's the last time UCLA basketball was relevant. I mean, for that one year... When they played, and I remember they beat Kentucky in December, and they were a top-10 team, Pauley Pavilion was the place to be for about four or five months, and I believe they lost to that same Kentucky team in the tournament in the final eight or in the Sweet 16 round. And from that point on, UCLA basketball, believe it or not, despite this tradition, has been dormant. No one cares. There's no buzz. And then the other son... Uh, ended up stealing in China, and old Donald Trump had to bail him out. But then the third son, I think, was good enough to make the NBA. So, again, you're telling me who's the better basketball dad, and if the goal is to make it to the association and actually living up to the big words of the father, I would say it's the balls. Yeah, I mean, look, some of that is outside of LeVar and LeBron's control. And so we may be giving LeVar credit, and, and I'm going to have to think this one through because I haven't, I just thought of the question in real time, but we may be crediting LeVar for what his wife actually brought to the table. <laughs> the jeans. So LeVar, seriously, Le, LeVar, yeah. I think, married a six-foot volleyball player. Uh, that's the kid's mother and his wife where uh, LeBron married his high school sweetheart, Savannah. And, and, and so 
LeVar and the talent and the size of his kids, LeVar is six foot six, I think the wife is six foot, you know, and so maybe, you know, LeVar's working or breeding with or having kids with uh, a higher athletic talent than, Le than LeBron. And so when I think of who's been the better basketball dad, and, and again, I know it's not the greatest question, but it is fascinating. I, I just think LeVar put pressure on kids who actually had the talent and the genes to respond to that pressure. LeBron put pressure, particularly as it relates to Bronny so far, and probably Bryce, that, that they just don't have the genes, the athleticism, the size, the skill, or even the desire, perhaps. Because yeah. LeBron's worth, when your dad's worth a billion dollars, you know, how, how much, you know, you're sleeping on uh, silk sheets your whole life. You're not Marvin Hagler getting out there running four miles a day, crack a dawn. Whereas LeVar, much more humble background, this guy was a personal trainer. And so that's where I credit LeVar didn't put too much on his kids' plates. LeBron perhaps did. Well, a loquacious LeVar, but the only thing humble about him is his background. And speaking of the wife, I read a quote one time that he specifically chose her because he looked at, like, he sized her up. He said, that's got good genetics. He probably had, like, an NFL combine, probably had her doing push-ups, bench press, 40-yard dash, probably had her shoot a few layups, both hands. Like, okay, honey, I'll take you out. We'll go to in and out Go to in and out the first time. We'll see where – and look what happened. But I also know that LeVar, because I saw a few features – he coached them personally uh, off the court. He had his own set of exercises, own set of drills in their backyard, uh, out there where they lived. But, you know, look, we talk about the gene pool and we talk about the spouses. All right, well, what about LeBron's gene pool? That's pretty good to draw upon. I mean, this guy is an athletic freak who was God-gifted. So, you know, no matter who LeBron married, short of someone that's the size of Vern Troyer, they're going to have a little bit of size. I What I think where LeBron really goofed is some of these tweets a couple years ago when he's talking about his kid being some sort of lottery pick. That is solely on LeBron. And, and again, and I see this in boxing all the time with fathers who are the trainers and now managers. Everybody believes that they have the next Roy Jones or Floyd Mayweather or Oscar De La Hoya. I've never actually heard a father come up to me and say, Steve, you got to do my story on my son. I think he's just going to be a good, solid contender. He might make some money. No, 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 no. Everyone's going to be the pay-per-view, pound-for-pound star. So part of doing this, you got to know what you have. And LeBron considers himself some sort of basketball genius, basketball savant. Okay. It's not just athletic talent. He, he actually, you know, knows the game. He's a student of the game. He's, you know, he's Isaiah Thomas. He's Bob Cousy. He's, you know, he, he's, he's playing the game with his mind. And he, it, again, it's like part of, they had an evaluation, LeBron and these guys did, on Andrew Wiggins coming out of Canada when he was entering the NBA draft after one season in Kansas. LeBron didn't want any parts of him because he thought, you know, kids from Canada you know, too soft, didn't have the same hunger. And that's part of the reason why Cleveland made the moves they did with Kevin Love and, and all of that early on. And, and so, and I know people are blinded by their own kids, but, but I just think by the time these kids are 12, 11 years old, LeBron should have like figured out like, yeah, they didn't get as much of me as they needed to be great basketball prospects. They, and not disrespecting Savannah at all, because you know, we just had Gottlieb on, and this, these, particularly Bronny, he went on and on and on and gush. Like, this is a great kid. This is a great human being. LeBron should have been able to recognize, like, yeah. hey, my sons aren't gonna be, uh, they're not Dame Lillard, they're not, they're not that. You know, they're going to be great kids that can play college basketball and maybe they'll be NBA agents. Maybe they'll be something coaches or whatever. I just think he should have been able to see that if he's as smart about basketball as he pretends.
Well, when it came to his own son, he obviously wasn't Lamarty Blake. Uh, but here's the thing. <laughs> that we have to keep this into perspective. Ron, Ronnie James was probably, what, a top 100 player in his class, right? That means you're the top 1% of the 1%. He's a legitimate Division I player, no matter what we say. That's a great achievement. If you had sons and you'd say, hey, he's not going to necessarily be a first-round draft choice, but he'll get his education paid for at a fine institution, and he'll have a chance to play on TV in front of millions of people and make the tournament and earn a great degree. I think most parents, most would say, we'll take that. I found it surprising that LeBron, who has provided for his family very well, and living in an economic stratosphere that he could only dream of as a kid, would he himself put the pressure? It wasn't any of us. Um, and you never know about Ronnie. Let's look ahead. Kawhi Leonard at the same age, and again, I'm just using this as a comparison. I would, I would venture to guess that Kawhi Leonard as an 18-year-old freshman probably was not the guy that he became as a 21, 22-year-old upperclassman at San Diego State. That, that, so let's see where this goes. The pressure on LeBron to be a one and done, that is solely on LeBron. And for now him to, to push back, it kind of reminded me, sort of, I don't know if you remember, a quarterback at the University of Kentucky, his name was Andre Woodson. Um, he played in about 2006, 2007. He had a rocket arm. I remember watching him saying, this guy's got some potential. And then Todd McShay, of all people, said, Number one pick in the draft. He didn't say just first round. He said he's going to be the top pick. And everyone's like, really? Ended up being a sixth round draft choice. Here's the difference. That wasn't Andre Woodson's father. That's just a guy who goofed. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not a great look for him. Mel Kuyper probably gets a good kick out of it. But LeBron should have known better. You know, Michael Jordan's kids played college basketball, right? You know, There funny. you go. That's where I was going. Yeah. When they played, I didn't know where they played. I didn't even know if they played. He didn't seem to put any pressure. He almost seemed like he was very detached. And I thought I thought that was the best thing he could do given his own profile. Now, uh, perhaps he was a bit too detached, and that's how one of his sons ended up with Lars okay, Pippen. So he, uh, oh, that's out of bounds. That's out of bounds. Let's call a timeout on that. Oh my God. I, I knew you were gonna go there. God. I apologize but, for your No, where I'm just, I think one of his kids, I think maybe played at Central Florida. Yeah. Played Division I basketball, yeah. one of his sons. And, and we never heard any of this type of talk out of Michael Jordan. There have been countless former NBA high-level players uh, who, who've had sons, and we've never heard any of them get hyped the way that you, you, you think Magic ever hype? I'm sure at some point, Magic's uh, Johnson, six foot five son, uh, at some point, maybe at three, four, five years old, looked like he may <laughs> have had some sort of NBA prospect. In a different direction, yeah. Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that clear. <laughs> or maybe Magic Athletics saw something very early thing. on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there's been a lot of former players. Even, you know, not that he would have had the attention, but like Kobe Bryant's dad played in the NBA. Jelly and, Bean. And somehow, yeah, somehow Jason, Kobe, you know. Let me give you an example. Uh, Walter Payton, one of the greatest ever. God bless sweetness. Okay. On the Mount Rushmore of any running back list. Okay. And his son, Jarrett Payton, went to the University of Miami. Uh, didn't really play early in his career. It was a stacked running back room. Had all sorts of all pros in front of him. Willis McGahee, Clinton Portis, Frank Gore. And he finally got a shot in 2003 uh, after Frank Gore went down. Had about 950 yards. And was good enough to actually make a roster. I think he had a little bit of a run with the Tennessee Titans. And I don't look at that as being a failure. I think he maximized his ability. And he did great. He's, he was a great college player. He was a great ambassador for the Hurricanes. Everyone spoke very highly of him. I actually remember seeing Walter's widow, Connie Payton, at the games. A very nice lady. Um, he had a strong senior year. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, Jason, if you ever go to a playground or an L.A. fitness where guys hoop, there are guys out there that only played junior college, right? But they're about 6'5", and it they just dominate. And could you imagine? You have to be... 
unbelievable. Imagine what a Division One guy would do against regular human beings or guys that were just good enough to be like N one hoopers. Because those guys have tried to go out on real basket. They get dominated. The guys that we saw on TV, hot sauce, um, you know, half man, half amazing. To be a Division One player at a major conference. See, I don't look at Bronny as a failure. I really don't. I look at him as a guy that's really, really talented, that has a shadow that I don't think that he will ever be able to overcome in terms of basketball. And his father, unfortunately, he's the one who put more pressure on him, not the public. You, you, that, that again is why I got to give the LeVar Ball the nod is because Bronny's going to have a really solid, a great college career. Yeah. And if LeBron had left this situation alone, that's all anybody would talk about. It's like, man, LeBron James' son, four-year starter at USC, graduated, you know, uh, helped them win X, Y, and Z. What a great success story that was. But because of the hype from LeBron, it's this kid – is going to walk around feeling like, man, I wasn't an NBA lottery pick. I didn't make the NBA. I'm a failure. And, and, and I, I know me bringing this up and talking about it is going to really upset the LeBron groupies. Uh, but, but this is what I'm talking about in terms of LeBron just does, there's no strategy. There's no, we give LeBron all this credit, like, oh, he's managed this terrific NBA career and he's been so strategic. And he, what's the name? Uninterrupted, all the media company and the barbershop show he had on HBO. None of that stuff has worked. None of it. LeBron mm -hmm. has survived off his talent in every endeavor. What, what was the movie he did, Space Jam 2? It wasn't yeah. any good. Thumbs Every down. piece Thumbs. of success LeBron has had has been because he was blessed in the womb and he's worked hard as a basketball player. But all this more than an athlete, he, needs, he ain't even more than a basketball player. He, he, he is <laughs> well, a, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. Well, but Jason. He hasn't been strate strategic about anything else. And he's put his son in a bad spot. And I apologize for talking about it and perhaps trying to give other fathers some advice so they don't make the same mistake. But that is the truth. Well, I sent it to you. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but Scap Attack thinks there's other reasons why LeBron has made it so long as a basketball player. We'll talk about that another time when you watch that video. But yeah, that, that meme that I love where Homer Simpson comes out through the bushes. Well, hold, hold for one second. Since you yeah. went there, hold for one second. Since you went there, you know Kevin Garnett has co-signed that, right? Yes, he has. He flat did, out Did you said see the it. Kevin Garnett video? Yes. Yes. He, it's referenced in the scap attack. Yes. Yeah, he's on that Balco. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I love I love the, I love the, anyway, uh, the screen. I, I love the thumbnail that the scap attack used given my association and my relationship and friendship with Victor Conte called him La Balco. I sent that over to Victor Conte. He'll get a great <laughs> kick out of that. But anyway, but you, you know that meme that I love to reference or Homer Simpson's coming out of the bushes. We need to put a face of LeBron on that saying brawny lottery one and done. And then as he's backing up into the bushes, let the kid develop, man. We just want to see him get his education from USC. <laughs> uh, guys, Ren, anybody listening, we need that yeah, meme. Yeah, get working on that. Uh, get working on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we need that meme. That's a great suggestion. But listen, you just, tomorrow, I'm, we're going to reach out to uh, Scap Attack. Get him on. And Good guy. It, that LeBalco thing needs to be addressed and talked about. I mean, look, Kevin Garnett is Flat one of the greatest it. NBA players of all time. He put it on the table. And we're all, including me, acting like, hey, let's don't even talk about it. It's not even worth talking about. Yeah, crickets. One of the greatest crickets. players. That, yeah. And I even blame myself. We should probably be talking about it today. Jason. But we will this week. Bond <laughs> was a Barry Bonds level personality where a lot of people hated him, whether that was fair or not. And I've always thought it was a little unfair. I'm actually a defender of Barry Bonds in certain ways. He belongs in the Hall of Fame. He's the best player I've ever seen. Really, the most dangerous lethal hitter for a period. And again, I'm not denying anything, but if he was that level of personality 
and, or he didn't have these political beliefs or didn't use himself as a democratic liberal puppet, this would be a story. This would be a story. Instead, what we hear is cricket, 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 cricket. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Steve, uh, thank you so much. Uh, great job as always. Uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Uh, we'll play some tomorrow and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.